Warning, this video contains minus spoilers. Hi. If there's anybody still debating on who's best girl, I think that CG settles the debate. <laughs> This story revolves around a lucky bastard called Shirogane Takeru, who is an ordinary high school student that has a passion for mecha games. Cool, he's one of my people. One day, he woke up in his bed lying next to a gorgeous girl. Okay, he's no longer one of my people. After that, she moved into his house straight away due to her fixation towards the protagonist, aided by her vast wealth and resources from her status as an heiress, and thus causing the lives of Takeru and his childhood friend to change drastically. The lucky bastard, for now, the adorable cat lolly, the sundere, the kudere, the osana najimi, and the ojo-sama. There's nothing much to say about Takeru, he's just another average high school student and is a bit of an ass and a lazy fool. but hey, who isn't lazy? He is dense, but I wouldn't say he's that dense as he does grow to acknowledge his own drawbacks. When the situation arises, Takeru will step up and show his worth. One example is when he expressed himself to all of the lacrosse team members during the lacrosse arc. It really shows that he cares and is observant towards his harem. That was a joke by the way. There is no harem ending in this VN, and I'm content with that. I'll explain later. For now, let's talk about one of the heroines, who is a lolly. Tamase Miki. Airhead, clumsy, energetic, and also a hardworking girl. To me, she's basically like the mascot of the group. Quite cute. Miki is part of the archery club, and she's actually quite good at it, being the daughter in a distinguished family that specializes in traditional Japanese archery. The problem with her though is that she finds it difficult to use her skills if anyone starts to observe her, as she gets distracted by it and therefore loses focus. On a side note, she has like one of the weirder hairstyle designs, especially when viewed from the back, but it gets way better when she's in her archery clothing. Personally speaking, twin tail hairstyle just sucks. Another character that unfortunately has twin tails, or rather twin braids in this case, is Sakaki Chizuru who is normally referred to as class rep. The hairstyle is not as bad though, plus it's compensated by glasses. Glasses fetish for the win. It is when she lets her hair down that she becomes more beautiful as well. Okay, that's enough with the hairstyle nitpicks. Chizuru is kind of a goody two-shoes character. Someone who insists on the rules. Pretty much the fun police, which is understandable since she is the representative of the class and an ex-member of the student council. To add to that, she is also a sundere, which was not expected to be honest. Not high level though, I would say low since I didn't get annoyed by her. Thank f***ing god for that. She did slap the protagonist like three times if I recall correctly but Eh, he was justified. He was a jerk and so deserved. Shizuru also dislikes her polar opposite, who is Ayamine K. The Kudere. Stoic, rebellious, sarcastic, blunt, and lazy. Someone who skips school often. No wonder she irritates Chizuru. In fact, she irritates Takeru as well due to her sarcasm. That being said, she gets along quite well with Miki, probably because she's like the mascot as I've said. And the fact that she wants everyone to get along, but hey, good to see a positive relationship at least. Interestingly, despite her skipping school, She's actually quite smart, getting perfect scores in exams, if I recall correctly. Man, I wish I had her brain. Uh, no, no. She's usually a selfish person, but she does contribute when it matters, especially during the lacrosse arc. I also find it intriguing that she uses that hand pose sometimes when she replies. Kinda reminds me of the Terminator pose. Talk to the hand. The next character is Kagami Sumika the childhood friend. A cheerful Daredare who is an airhead but also short-tempered which can lead to her being immaturely aggressive. And it gets physical, such as punching Takeru all the way to space and it gets quite annoying as it progresses. Not to say that they're without reason though, the protagonist usually teases Sumika and thus she only responds in kind. Still, they do get a bit too exaggerating at times. Another example is when she blamed Takeru for opening his water closet while she was in there without him knowing she was there to begin with. That happened twice and it lowered my affection towards her. Regardless, they both have a good friendship with each other and she supports him through and through. Sumika wakes Takeru up in the morning on a daily basis, cooks for him, and even asks about his situation during the night conversations at the iconic window scene. The perfect wife material, basically. What attracts me the most about her is that 
idiot hair. If I recall correctly, Takeru calls it an antenna and I don't disagree. It sorta of acts like that depending on her mood and even makes a heart shape, all of which are very adorable to look at. Oh yeah, ponytail too, so that's a win. Another ponytail win is the last main heroine, which is the Ojo-sama, Mitsurugi Meiya, the ridiculously rich heiress. Another there there just like Sumika, but she expresses her affections differently, probably more direct, relatively speaking. I mean, in the first hour of the VN, you already see her beside you in bed. That's due to her lacking a bit of common sense and tending to be oblivious at some points. Meiya is also highly likely to do things very excessively, and that is an understatement. One example is that she bought the whole fucking neighborhood around Takeru's house and his neighbors moved out. Then she built a goddamn mansion beside it. If that's not ridiculously over the top, I don't know what could be. It's not really her fault though, she was just raised that way, as the heiress to one of the largest conglomerates in the world. Since she is the upcoming head of the family, Maya has faithful servants who assist her in her endeavor, and some of them will be in the next section. The hot-blooded rival, his competitive daughter, the overprotective father, the remorseful doctor, No f***ing way. The airheaded survivalist, the true and loyal friend, the supportive classmate, Tilf number one, Tilf number two. A maid that is one of the best characters ever in the visual novel industry. And her three annoying little sh. There are other side characters, some don't have sprites but all are voiced. Though they don't matter as much so I'm lazy to find and put them in here. Main menu page with music that gave me nostalgia. Load button that leads to 20 pages with 6 slots each and 6 pages of quick load. Options button to 4 settings pages. Here's the first with advanced settings that you will highly likely never touch. Second page is like this and the third page... Fui. Fourth? Fuck! Extras brings you here. Gallery for the usual and a clear list to show all the endings you've completed which is nice. Unfortunate that the jukebox and theater aren't open yet until unlimited is completed I believe but eh whatever. Since this game comprises of two timelines you can access them after the start button. Then choose your image language and then the stories themselves. Gameplay session is mostly in ADV but there are a few NVL moments like this in the beginning here. UI is ridiculously clean. Not even a text box and even even the options are like this, so if you want to access anything, just right click and all the buttons will pop up. This is one of the more interactive VNs in terms of visuals. You have mouth flaps, head icons, chibi movements, mecha maneuvers, and back facing sprites. As for the English translation, I didn't notice any grammatical or typo errors, so that's awesome. I took around 19.3 hours to finish all the endings while the NDB's average is around 45 hours and 4 minutes. Now the NDB's record here isn't limited to just extra because extra and unlimited are two parts of the same game so take that into account. I wonder why the NDB doesn't split it, just out of curiosity. Now, Move Love Extra has a story structure that I really despise and is the kind that is something like an affinity system for each waifu influenced by the choice prompts. To add insult to injury, there is a Fui. ton of choices. I've shown my frustration by this structure in Byaku and Chaos Head Noah, but I'm gonna do it again anyway. Huh? me off that I have to skip a bunch of stuff from the very beginning just to get into a different route. Moving on, as you can see in this clear list, you have 5 heroine endings and 2 normal ones. The structure itself however is not like the average visual novel. Take a look at this diagram. Every route will branch off after the lacrosse arc. The 2 normal endings, Tama is by herself here, Chizuru and Kei will branch off from this line, while Sumika and Meiya will split off from this one. This means that these two pairs have their respective common routes after the lacrosse arc, and then they will proceed into their own individual endings. For example, there is an onsen arc in the story, and this route will lead to either Sumika's or Meia's or Marimo's. Don't forget that we also have a Tilf route here. Why isn't she part of the clear list, Aju? This is discrimination. How dare you? My disappointment is immeasurable. 
and my day is ruined. Okay, this is one of the more popular visual novel series in the industry and I'm pretty sure you've already heard from a lot of people saying that the plot is generic and cliche. Thing is, they're not wrong. It's like a harem because all the heroines will eventually fall in love with you in their respective routes. But that's not unusual for a visual novel. That's why execution matters. And it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some moments were great, others were boring. It's a bit of a balance. Pacing is also mixed because at some points it felt a bit too long while at others it felt a bit too quick. There were a few repetitions of similar lines that occurred several times, at least twice if I recall correctly. And I found it weird that I couldn't skip it but hey, it's not really a major problem. On on a side note though, the character interactions are good, aided by good humor overall. I've had several laughs and I appreciate that. Character development is a bit lacking and it occurs quite late at least from the MC side but that's mainly due to his density. Heroines had good enough of a growth but some were overdue too. As for the endings, critically speaking, none of them were bad, except for one. That is Marimo's route. I guess this might come as a surprise to you guys who know one of my tastes that is tilth supremacy so I'll explain in the next section. The route order I went with is as shown on screen and as usual, I will always end the game with the waifu that I enjoy the most. There is something I would like to point out though. I read both of the normal endings first but they didn't register in the clear list so I had to read them again after finishing Marimo's route. Why did that happen? I don't know, probably a bug or something. Anyway, both common endings were normal enough, there's nothing to dislike about them. One ends legit after the lacrosse arc and the other is basically getting kidnapped alongside Mikoto in the middle of the ocean. The closest you get to a route with him if you want to think it that way. I do admire his survival skills though, it's just weird seeing him go with the flow a bit too much indulging his dad on his absurd actions. Maybe it's because he's already used to it I guess. Next, Miki's route and it was actually likeable for what it gave. It got boring sometimes but it caught up during the climax. At least she teaches about traditional Japanese archery. I don't know about you but I'm interested in that stuff. Her character development works, even Takeru's, though it's not deep as the other routes and it reminds me of Rika's route in Aokana. Still the ending was quite wholesome after a certain plot twist was revealed. Moving on, Chizuru's. Not a bad route honestly, it felt a bit boring in the beginning but then after some point it gets going. The point was when the MILF was introduced. Can you blame me for believing in MILF supremacy as well? I didn't include her in the side character section because I wanted to save the surprise for this moment. Actually no, it's just that VNDB doesn't have her picture. To me, she's not much of a fan service aside from her appearance, she actually provided meaning to Chizuru's route through her backstory and character as her mother. Due to that, Chizuru's personality and harshness are very understandable considering her upbringing. Personally, I think that this route is one of the best in the game. The character development, interactions, emotions, and both of the ugly and beautiful sides of humanity. Initially, I thought that the pacing at the end was a bit too long but after having some second thoughts, I appreciate the extension due to letting another character shine. That character was K, and her route was quite romantically dramatic. It branches off from the same timeline as Chizuru's route but of course you now focus on the Kudere instead of the Sundere. Not much character growth as in Chizuru's route but the interactions were better in my opinion. The drama is mostly tied to the doctor here and the story regarding him and K is actually quite unfortunate. It involves guilt, lingering regrets, sacrifice and the feeling of betrayal. Aside from that, I didn't really indulge in K's character as I thought I would despite it being her own route. And this is because of Meiya. Meiya sacrificed her feelings for Takeru in order to support him in his. She gave him advice and the push he needed for K. It really brought up that if you truly love someone then let them go mindset to her character. But before we head to Meiya's route, let's talk about her love rival. Sumika's actual route that branches off is short. Since it is one, shared with Meiya and two, you gotta consider that from the moment you start reading the story to be her route. It is so obvious that the writer intended to put both of them as the main girls in this story. Sumika's interactions with the MC, her actions, her encouragement, it all contributes to her ending. There's a reason why the window scene is so memorable. It happens often and with good reason. During the climax of the route, I believe that Sumika was at her best. She was prepared to support whichever decision Takeru would make even if it's the one that doesn't end up with her. That is a strong character, willing to sacrifice. 
selfless, just like Mia. Sumika became brave to express her feelings due to a large influence by her rival. Competition leads to action. And in that chat route, Sumika won in terms of fan service. <laughs> On the other hand though, Maya won the story itself. The backstory, the flashbacks, the promises made, the impact that Maya had in the plot was much more emotional in the climax. If I were to compare, Sumika's build-up is like a continuous bombing until a place is destroyed. It occurs throughout and you're pretty much aware of the reason why she loves you. Maya's on the other hand is like the calm before the storm. Stagnation and then suddenly a nuclear bomb exploded. You don't know why she's doing what she did or why she loves you until it hits you in the climax. Sure, there were some hints in the early to middle stages of the story but not enough to accurately deduce what happened. Plus, some misdirection was also used in the flashbacks. To add to that, Mia's route is the most adrenaline inducing in the game. It had over the top action that literally involves bullets shooting and explosions going off. Her dress at the end was also the most suitable to seal the deal between Takeru and herself. Nice symbolism, very fitting. What doesn't fit is Marimo's route. Now as biased as I am towards tilts, I try to be objective here. And objectively speaking, Marimo's route just sucks! I saved her ending for the last because of my subjective opinion favoring her character, but seriously, this route is terrible. It's just pure fan service. She shines much more when you're not in her route. Her role as a teacher, her innocence, her gloominess, and ultimately, her moral support for her students. Having a character like this being reduced to mere fan service in her own route is beyond insulting to her fans and even herself. This ending doesn't even feel half-assed. It's undercooked. It's raw. Raw, shit. Raw just like the dick you stick inside her. If you're gonna do a route for a waifu, make sure it's meaningful, please. Now, I'll admit, I still jacked off to her scenes because they were undeniably the best in the game. But that's just my desires kicking in. My rationale, however, begs to differ. Now, my route suggestions are, I find it's best to finish the common endings first, then Miki's, Kei's, and then Chizuru's, after that Marimo's, and finally Sumika's followed by Meiya's as the last. I'm sure I don't need to explain why you should clear the normal endings first, and the explanation on Miki's route was quite clear, I hope. Chizuru's and Kei's routes were switched because I think that Chizuru's story was better overall. Now, as to why Marimo's is after Chizuru's despite her ending being crap, it's because of the onsen arc. This arc is shared between all three waifus, so get rid of Marimo's first, and then Sumika's, and finally Meiya's. Yes, I truly believe that Meiya's ending is the best in this game. That's my honest opinion, and it's time for more. For the bad stuff, honestly speaking, aside from the horrible story structure, there's nothing much to dislike. I mean, I wish Miki's and Marimo's routes were done better, way better in Marimo's case, but I already talked about those. If there was one thing I could ask for, I wish there were more scenes for Akane, but that will be asking too much since she's already a main heroine in another game, that is Kimiga Nozomu Ayen, which is also by Aju. It's a shame though, because I really enjoyed her character. She was a true friend to the end. Now, the good stuff. Four things I want to give special recognition to. The first is the references. At least to my knowledge, they had a Goku powering up moment with Miki, virtual on with Valjean on, and the most obvious of all, was this goddamn chauffeur. They're not even hiding it. This is legit Takahashi and Takumi from Initial D merged into one character. Takumi's hair color and Takahashi's personality. Plus, he's even driving a car abnormally just like Takumi and even has Takahashi's voice actor. This is something I really, really appreciate as a casual Initial D fan. Hell, they even made a black and white car chase scene with a soundtrack that is similar to Eurobeat. amazing. Now, music is the next aspect. Personally speaking, I don't find any of the music here to be unsuitable and they just improve your experience by a lot, which is inherently a good thing because that's their job. If the music made me hum to it in game, then I will point out its effectiveness. Even if you don't like the story or the characters, the one thing you won't be disappointed by is the music. Another aspect that enhances your reading session is the voice acting. Some notable characters that I want to point out are Miki, Sumika, Meiya, Yuko, and Marimo. Putting my biases towards oh, no. aside, I think I also appreciate Meiya's way of talking when she adds yoi at the end. Meiya da. 
Just standing on general principles. That's my objective point of view. The subjective one, both. Both is good. <laughs> In all seriousness, it reminded me of a very memorable vision novel. And it involves... <laughs> Everywhere I go, I see her face. As for my choice, well, it's only for those that have read the VN. So if you haven't, please skip to the fun section. If you have, let's dive in. I will have two decisions here, one based on my biasness and the other on my rationale. Even though I will naturally pick the one that turned me on the most, I won't turn a blind eye to a character that deserves the spot. Subjectively, Marimo and Yuko are my best girls. It's not surprising to any of you that have been following my channel. I just can't choose between the two of them because they are like a match made in heaven. Marimo's character contradicts Yuko's mischievous and exaggerating deeds. They're like a magnet. Polar opposites yet strongly attracted to each other. It's difficult to separate them. Their interactions, their rivalry, their friendship. Yuko loves to tease and Marimo is just asking to be teased. That's why I can't just split them on my top spot. And people should give more recognition to Yuko to be honest. In the story, she's like the evil genius mastermind that manipulates people to her tune whether it's for better or for worse from the other character's perspective. Regardless, you gotta acknowledge that she's the underlying cause why a lot of things start to happen in the first place. She influences things from behind the scenes and it just fits her personality. Despite her over-the-top moments, she is a teacher at heart. Now, critically speaking, Miki, Chizuru, and Kei are out. So that obviously just leaves the two main girls remaining, either Sumika or Meiya. Drum roll! It's Mana. <coughs> hmm. Actually, most of the fans won't disagree with that claim though. Anyway, jokes aside, best girl is Meiya. And for that, I apologize to the Sumika fans. Before you smash that dislike button, let me give you my reasoning. It's easily the climax of the main story. It was meant for Maya, and the revelation made all her prior actions sensible. Her willfulness to not break her grandfather's condition is remarkable, which was to not reveal any information about the promise Takeru made to her when they were young kids back then. It must be painful to withhold that memory from him, and she had to struggle with that fact from the very beginning, all the way to the climax. And even at the climax, Meiya wasn't even the one to tell him. It was Sumika, because she believed that her pact was broken due to Takeru overhearing her and Mana. She tried. She tried a lot using what she knew to win Takeru over, to indirectly make the MC remember their promise, even if they're unorthodox. But can you really blame her for that? When they didn't work, Meiya adapted to Takeru's lifestyle. She was willing to change herself for him. Furthermore, she attempted to cook for Takeru, despite not knowing how to, even continuously blowing up the kitchen in the process. And even when Meya didn't get chosen, she still supported him. That's true love right there. Of course, Sumika is similar in that sense, but her decision to confess came way too late and it infuriates me, because that makes her better than I thought. She was the one who told about Meya's promise, then she confessed. Sumika wanted to be on equal grounds before pulling the trigger, despite having an advantage already. Admirable, but mistaken. The early bird catches the worm. She had too many opportunities but didn't use them. If only that memory didn't resurface, then I could safely say that Sumika's best girl. Trust me, I enjoyed most of her interactions more than Meiya's before the climax. But then, that flashback had to happen. Sometimes it just takes one thing to turn the table. And in this case, that promise 
undeniably did. So yeah, in my best girl ranking, I will place Marimo and Yuko as the first, then Meya, and finally Sumika in the top three. The poll majority wins, I guess. One guy in this court couldn't participate because he refuses to engage in Reddit, so here's his vote. Doesn't change the outcome, but I do appreciate your participation. All your participation. Maya fans win here, I guess. She's Takeru's woman, and you could even say that they married at the end there, considering the dress she was wearing when they fought. Speaking of which, Six scenes total, one for each main waifu and marimo. They involve the usual missionary, hot seat, spoon, yourself on a shelf, Australian kiss, fellatio, and my all-time favorite, the cowgirl. The scenes themselves are average in terms of length, and I would say that they're meaningful to initiate the relationship between the protagonist and the chosen heroine, except for marimo. Holy f Oi. that was just pure fan service. Her scene was the best out of all the six, yet it doesn't have any real value behind it. Damn it! Seriously, author. This is unfair. I do find it odd that all the scenes, aside from Marimo, occur right after the confession. Probably a pacing issue, or maybe I'm just used to each scenes taking their time to appear after the characters get together, I don't know. From my horny point of view, if I do get access, I might as well use it ASAP. <laughs> anyway, if you want to know more about my opinions on the fun stuff uncensored, then do consider joining my Patreon linked down below. This section is new to me because I find it quite important to address the community. Due to the height set by alternative, people who hear about it will highly likely get disappointed by extra should they wish to get into the franchise. The identity of this series is first known through its dark and dystopic setting, the gore of aliens eating humans, the mecha and the war. Yet you get none of these in extra. The mecha game was only a tease, not for real. It's unsurprising that extra would not be what you expected and you get disheartened by it. Believe Believe me, I was one of the victims when I first read it. I heard about Alternative first and I was let down when I started Extra. Seriously, what is this slice of life rom-com harem bullshit? Where is the grim and dark story? The gore? The suffering? The PTSD inducing chomp? No wonder why you would feel bored by the first entry into the trilogy. It's because you had too high of expectations, so do yourself a favor. Tone it down and enjoy it for what it gives. Sure, it's without a doubt not as good as Alternative. But it's not inherently bad in its own genre. That's what I learned from this second playthrough of mine. It's comedic, it's over the top, it's good enough to stand on its own feet. It's just dumb fun to consume. Sure, some parts are dull and uneventful, but isn't that as close as it gets to feeling real and to balance out those exaggerated moments? If you were to put yourself in Takeru's shoes in Unlimited and Alternative, You'd wish you would be living those boring lifestyles. That's how horrific it gets after the setting changes later on. As for the Move Loop fans, for those that are doing it, don't hype it up too much. Overhype ruins the experience for new players because it just sets a bar so high that it crumbles terribly when it isn't met. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. To conclude, Move Love is a good vision novel for what it offers as a rom-com. It's a fun VN to absorb, and it serves as an introduction to the characters for the sequels, but not without its own story to stand on. I've seen a lot of people recommend to just read Sumika or Meya's route at least if you want to skip. My response to this suggestion is, I wholeheartedly disagree. You should read all the endings. Since you bought the whole VN, why shouldn't you read the whole VN? Get your money's worth and take your time to finish. The game's not going anywhere and you shouldn't feel pressured to speed run the story anyway. If you want to get into the story, you should commit. Don't half ass it, just like the author did with Mari Mosra. The visual novel community reads books basically. We should be patient with long stories. They need time to develop. I understand if you not want to spend several hours of your life just to then get to the good parts. And if you honestly feel that way, then please be my guest to drop it. No one should be forced to take in something that is not their cup of tea. That being said, I still stick to the mindset that either you commit fully or not at all. I will give Move Love Extra a DGEN score of 8. That's enough yapping for now. I wrote more than 5,000 words for my script and it's f***ing hot, my god. Hope you guys can like and subscribe. Consider supporting me further through Patreon and later DGENs.